Hello, I'm Sue Nelson, a science journalist and author, and welcome to the Royal Society of Chemistry's series discussing chemistry and climate change. As we look forward to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in November. For nearly three decades, the United Nations has been bringing together people from almost every country on Earth for global climate summits. And as you'd expect from the Royal Society of Chemistry, they'll be showing that chemistry is vital for understanding and tackling climate change, with a focus on batteries and energy storage. In this series, we'll showcase chemistry's contribution to electrifying the planet's energy transition to net zero and powering new discoveries and innovations. The shift to electric vehicles or EVs will require substantial amounts of critical minerals and other raw materials. This raises the questions of where they come from and what will happen at the end of their lives. Processing EV batteries for a second life will extend their use, but ultimately recycling and recovering will be necessary. Well, this panel will talk about the latest research to understand this problem and developing pathways to reach a circular economy. Joining me to dis discuss this are an international panel of chemistry experts uh, who I'd like them to introduce themselves with a brief overview of their work, but I will give their name and affiliation first. And the first person to um, explain about their work is Dr. Jacqueline Edge from Imperial College London. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jacqueline Edge. I work at Imperial College and I'm the Faraday Institution project leader for the Multiscale Modeling Batteries Project. Um, I have been the project manager, the research manager for the past three years but I'm now becoming a co-investigator working on the techniconomics and the life cycle assessment of batteries. So that's looking across the whole value chain of batteries and across the whole life cycle and assessing sort of the bigger picture impacts. Professor Andy Abbott now from the University of Leicester. Hello, my name is Andy Abbott. I'm a professor of physical chemistry at the University of Leicester. Uh, and like Jackie, I'm also part of the Faraday Institution, but our project is uh, Relib. So the Relib project is a um, consortium of Birmingham University, Newcastle, uh, Leicester, Edinburgh, and uh, UCL. We are looking at all aspects of recycling a variety of different battery materials. We're looking, uh, starting with the triage, which is uh, looking at the state of health of the batteries, uh, and then moving on to various uh, wet recycling uh, processes making new cells and then also uh, testing them, but also looking at uh, aspects of design for recycle. As part of the project, we're also looking at various legal and socioeconomic uh, aspects of recycling and their impacts on the environment. Thank you. Dr. Solomon Brown now, who's with me at the Royal Society of Chemistry and he's from the University of Sheffield. Uh, so I'm, I'm Dr. Sol Brown. I'm the Director of the Centre for Doctoral Training in Energy Storage, hosted at, at the University of Sheffield. I'm also a member of the SafeBat project, which is also a Faraday Institution project. Uh, and we focus on, uh, similar to Jacqueline, looking at the life cycle and value of batteries and energy storage more widely, um, and look at how that can be used to optimise our transition towards uh, net zero. Thank you. And our final guest, who's in the United States, and that's Professor Paul Anastas at the Yale School of the Environment. Hello, and it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm Paul Anastas. I'm a professor at Yale University, and I'm also the director of the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale. This center is founded across many different schools, the School of the Environment, the School of Engineering, Departments of Chemistry, Department of Public Health. And why is that? It's because it is dedicated to the design of products and processes and materials that are more sustainable. And in order for that work to go from basic research into positive societal impact, we feel that we need to engage all the different disciplines and all of the different perspectives. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. 
Well, let's open up the discussion now and um, I'll start with you, uh, Jacqueline. You, you've studied the whole life cycle of lithium ion batteries. How much of the impact is associated with the raw materials and how much is associated with the waste processing? So it depends on which processes we're talking about in terms of which manufacturing processes, which recycling processes. It also depends on exactly which battery chemistries we're talking about. Um, each chemistry has a different set of impacts. And it also depends on how you use it and where you use it. Um, but talking sort of very generally, looking sort of globally, um, I think approximately half of the global, uh, greenhouse gas emissions can be associated with just extracting the materials and refining them to the quality that we need for batteries. Um, about 30% is uh, roughly to do with assembling the cells in the battery packs. And then if we look at the end of the life cycle, approximately 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions can be ascribed to current recycling processes. Um, but it is hoped that this will be changed over time. But also we think uh, you also have to consider the fact that um, electric vehicles across their entire lifetime are still a vast improvement on internal combustion engines. So that's the major part then is, is the extraction. And are some sort of... Uh, materials worse than others in terms of the impact? Yes, definitely. Cobalt is quite a high um, energy and many other impacts as well. Um, material, nickel is very high impact. Aluminium is very high impact. Um, cobalt particularly is, is one of the big issues because it has a very high cost, a human cost, because of the toxicity of the cobalt and the people working in the mines. Um, but uh, there are other materials such as nickel, which are very high impact. So while there is a trend to move away from cobalt, that necessarily comes with a trade towards nickel. So um, we're not necessarily improving the impacts by switching to nickel. And will having this principle of a, a circular economy, will that make a, a big difference to the sustainability of the batteries? Um, definitely, it should make a big difference um, because if you can bypass the, the extraction and the refinement steps and introduce recycled materials, then that should lower the emissions such as uh, sulfates and greenhouse gases. Um, but we also need to consider other factors uh, such as uh, habitat destruction, water contamination. Um, a lot of these other factors have been ignored in favor of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but generally, yes, there should, we should see improvements for the circular economy. Andy, you're involved in the Relib project at the Faraday Institution, um, looking at finding new ways of, of managing electric vehicle battery waste. How does industry currently recycle and, or manage batteries at the end of their life? Well, mostly uh, recycling processes tend to be uh, some form of evolution from what's already uh, existing. Uh, and what's happening at the moment is there are a variety of uh, processes which are able to recycle nickel and cobalt. Uh, these are either pyrometallurgical, so high temperature um, processes, um, similar to sort of uh, steel uh, smelting, or they're based on uh, acids and, and bases, sort of hydrometallurgical processes. Um, and these have been uh, applied to, to battery materials but it should be stressed that at the moment, because the number of vehicles on, on the ro world's roads are relatively small, the recycling um, capability is, is relatively small because there, there are very few um, spent vehicles actually on the market themselves. But there are numerous, probably about, about 30 plants around the world uh, capable of uh, dealing with uh, hundreds to thousands of tonnes a year of waste material. Uh, there are also two new plants just opened up in China, which are capable of uh, dealing with 100,000 uh, tonnes per year of uh, spent battery material each. Um, so uh, that gives you sort of some, some perspective that, that there is capacity at the moment uh, to deal with these materials. And clearly the recycling is, is having two effects. So firstly, it's uh, neutralising uh, material, making sure that it's not hazardous. Uh, and secondly, um, as Jack has just said, it, it's obviously decreasing the um, burden on mining um, and also putting material back into that circular economy. And is it a, a difficult process to extract the material and, and, and recycle the battery? Uh, at the moment, it is, it's relatively difficult because of the, mostly because of the design of the, um, 
overall battery pack. Um, so to give people who, who sort of have no idea of, about um, the, the, the average vehicle, so it depends on the, on the manufacturer, um, but for example, if you have a, a Tesla, for example, you might have 4,000 uh, small cells in there. If you've got something like a, a, a Nissan, um, then they, they sort of look more like sort of uh, uh, packets uh, and you may have several hundred of these packets all put together in the, in the powertrain. And the, the difficulty you have is actually uh, not so much in, in terms of um, the, the chemistry of that, but it is the, in fact, mechanics of being able to um, disassemble the overall uh, pack structure um, and then be able to get that into your uh, recycling process in a safe manner. So that's really the, the difficulty that we experience currently with, with recycling technologies. And, and are there any better ways that are either currently being researched or in the pipeline um, to recover those metals? Yeah, I mean, there, there, you can see that certainly coming out of, of China and, and South Korea, particularly at the moment, there's, there's a lot in the pattern literature about cells which are easier to uh, disassemble. Uh, and I think that a lot of um, uh, car manufacturers are, are looking at this idea of, of design for recycle. And the same happened you know, 50 years ago with, with lead acid batteries. It's, it's an evolution of battery design that gets it to something that is easy to put together and easy to pull apart. So obviously if it's easier to, to pull apart, then in, in principle they're, they're easier to put together in, in the first place. The difficulty arises then to, to be able to do that in, in a safe manner and to, to achieve the right sort of longevity for the cell. Well, this would be a good uh, place to bring in Paul, who's a pioneer of green chemistry, actually being called the father of, of green uh, chemistry. How do you think we should be applying those principles to battery manufacturing, the reuse and uh, recycling at the end of their lives? Well, thank you for that question, because I think the most important concept in the definition of green chemistry is the concept of design. Green chemistry is the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or eliminate the use and generation of hazardous substances. So how do you think about design? Because if you take a look back at um, how chemists, chemical engineers, the, the chemical enterprise has has done in solving problems. It's been absolutely astoundingly good with generating near technological miracles. We've been really bad at defining problems. So we define the, the problems based on a particular performance that we want. And yet we've been able to generate new inventions to give us that performance and yet still give us unintended consequences of of various hazards, toxicity, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. So I think when we're talking about this, this issue of, um, of battery recycling, we may want to step back and say, are we defining the problem correctly? Um, so do we really want to talk about recycling of batteries? Do we want to talk about how we're going to achieve energy storage? Uh, the difference between how you define the problem are the degrees of freedom that you have in the solutions. So we often start from the status quo technology and we figure out how to deal with that, how to tweak it, how to improve it, how to make it more efficient, more socially and legally acceptable. When what we should be doing from a design perspective, of course, is what form follows function. So what is the function that we're trying to achieve. And is it batteries or is it energy storage? Because we know that there's so many different ways of storing energy. Um, so certainly if you are thinking of energy storage in terms of um, hydrogen or, or other uh, organics or, uh, or inorganics, then that's going to be a very different equation when it comes to just simply recycling our status quo batteries today. So the principles of green chemistry really start from the element of design and then looks across the life cycle of whether or not at the end, it should be recycled and reused based on its embedded complexity and embedded energy, or it should be designed to degrade harmlessly into the environment. 
So these are some of the design questions that the principles of green chemistry would use in order to, to really prompt our invention engine and focus it on how we, we, we get what we genuinely want rather than trying to make the status quo a little bit more efficient. And by looking at the design then and thinking of how do we redesign or redefine the, the problem, this will also sort of cross potentially different scientific disciplines. So are there complementary areas of scientific research that can actually help recycling electronic waste and recovering those you know, really important minerals that you don't want to just let go effectively? Yes, I absolutely believe that it needs to be an interdisciplinary enterprise uh, to do this, because even if we look at the, the latest research around traditional battery technology and recycling technology, there's some very interesting work that gets away from, you know, precious metals, it gets away from um, conflict minerals, uh, such as cobalt, and uses things like iron. Um, I won't say the names of the companies that are emerging in this area because you never want to affect the stock market, but there's some really interesting iron-based batteries. There's, I, I could talk about some of the wonderful emerging science on using uh, literally biological agricultural wastes to reclaim the lithium in lithium batteries. And there's some very interesting cutting edge technologies there. Uh, so at every level of development, either near term that we can apply immediately, medium term where we, where we change the, the form of the product itself, or the longer term where we start thinking about what is the ultimate underlying function. All of those will require different disciplines, different ways of thinking, and maximum degrees of freedom in design. And nanotechnology, is that a, 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 a good area for, for, for you? Could be, could be. I mean, uh, you know, so uh, making things smaller is, uh, it has its advantages. Uh, changing the character and the nature of the materials is perhaps even more important. But uh, nanotechnology can can play a role, uh, but also shifting uh, from you know from the way that we've thought things had to be to the way we can imagine things could be. I I always say all all scientific uh, inventions had to be science fiction before they became a reality. So we looked at the recent Nobel Prize in chemistry, and you know there was a, a way of thinking that that catalysts had to be metal-based, right? Um, had to be based on metals if it, if it wasn't an enzyme. And yet then we introduced organic catalysis uh, that just recently won the Nobel Prize. Rethinking how we, how we believe we can accomplish the function of energy storage is also a wonderful challenge. Um, Solomon, if we move to you now, you know, once we've manufactured batteries, people want to make sure they get the most uh, use out of them. What can we currently do to extend the use of lithium ion batteries? So dur during the use phase of, of the battery, what, you're, what you would try to do is manage the cycle behavior of the battery. So you don't want to, they're, they're beasts that don't like to be tampered with too much. They don't like intemperate temperatures. You want to manage the, th the thermal load. Uh, you want to manage the, the demand that you put, put across the battery, so you don't want to cycle it too fast. Um, you want, and particularly when you're at pack level, so you look at within the EV or for stationary storage, what you're interested in is making sure that the, the current that you're flowing through that battery is spread across the pack. So you're making sure that you're making best use of every single uh, cell that you have, rather than most of that power coming from parts of the pack. And that both helps you manage the, the thermal load that's coming out of the, out of the cells themselves and maintains the, the state of health of the batteries. Along with that, that you need to develop very accurate and efficient battery, battery management systems. So you need to understand what's happening to the cells. Um, and part of that 
is being able to measure what's happening within the cells. So it's uh, for, from a management point of view to extend their life, you want to get a better view of what's happening within the cell and then build that into really smart algorithms for, for managing their use. And you're also looking at fast charging batteries as well. Yes, so uh, ide ideally, obviously, if you're driving an EV uh, and you need to stop off to charge it, you, you don't want to wait the best part of the day. So you would want to increase the amount of charging, uh, the charging rate that your, your EV has. And ideally, so that there's been some technology recently that has claimed that they can charge within five minutes um, for, for, a, for a given EV. And that, what you need to manage that against is the demand on the electricity grid that, that, that is placed there. So if, if you're charging a, a battery uh, very fast, you, you will damage the battery. Uh, so you will degrade its use, its, its, its lifetime. Um, so the, the cell won't last as long, essentially. But you're also playing a heavy, placing a heavy burden on the rest of the network. So there's, there's a level of balancing the amount of rate of charge that you can get into your cell against what the wider network and the battery itself can take. Are there any other trade-offs or are they the, the main ones when it comes to increasing charging time? I, I would say they're, they're the main ones. So to, to, to charge a typical car battery in five minutes places about a megawatt load on the local network and to reinforce a, a local network at an engineering level to provide that for 30 or 40 cars is, is a challenge. Um, your batteries also won't last that long. <laughs> so the lifetime and, and the, the life cycle analysis of your, of your battery will, will decay. So managing that process is, is both a socioeconomic issue, so managing people's expectations of what they can get from their, their battery and, and, and their movement from a petrol car where they can charge quite quickly, um, and then managing a, syst a systemic control of what that battery can do. So I, I think that that's such an excellent point um, and an excellent discussion around the battery management system. Uh, so one of the things that we talk about, we, we are used to uh, uh, an entity, if it's a battery, having a certain performance. I, I'm lucky enough that a number of years ago, back at the beginning, I, I was able to purchase a Tesla. And my Tesla had a certain range for uh, that battery. I received a software update over the air that adjusted the battery management system and optimized it. It increased my battery life by approximately, I'll say about 10%. Now, it didn't change the battery, changed the software. And so this kind of, of thinking about how do we do things not simply by changing the, the materials and, uh, and, and physically adjusting it, uh, but these other types of approaches can be very, very powerful. Yeah, Jacqueline, um, can, can you reuse the lithium ion batteries after they've been in an electric vehicle? So I'm in two minds about this. I think in a lot of ways we have to be strategic about it and decide which chemistries, uh, you know, which life cycles fit which chemistries best and which applications we're talking about. Um, you have to consider firstly that uh, it takes about 10 years before electric vehicle batteries become available for re recycling. And in the case of some chemistries, we might want those, those materials to go straight back into new batteries as soon as possible because then they displace the impacts that happen at extraction stage. And other chemistries, it might be more important to extend their life further in say a second life use. But then that second life use um, probably won't be as powerful as it was in electric vehicles. It would have to be sort of a downgraded use, um, which a lot of grid applications are proving to be right for but there are still some grid support applications that need that much higher power. So uh, it's really important to, I think, to tailor our life cycle uh, stages towards each chemistry and think about which applications they go into. But generally, if you extend the lifetime of the materials, then you are furthering the use of all the embodied energy and materials that you put into that device. So generally extending lifetime is correct, but I think in some cases it's not the right answer. Can I? Yeah, sure. So I, 
I, I entirely agree with Jacqueline's point about the, the second launch batteries. I, I think particularly at, at grid scale uh, for, for, for stationary storage use of batteries, I think the use of second life cells is really important for enabling the, the amount of energy uh, storage as opposed to power services, which, which, are, which batteries are really good at. So they're very high power, they can provide power services to the network. But the second life batteries, a, because they're cheaper, um, allow you to, to extend the amount of energy, so bulk energy that you've stored. And that is an increasingly important thing that our energy, energy system needs. Um, so I, I think that's a really key piece of technology. I think you generally care less about the state of, uh, about the state of health in regards to, to the amount of capacity a cell still has at grid scale. So it, it doesn't matter that you've degraded the capacity of the cell in the same way that an EV cares. And so it, it's kind of, a, it, it, it's a way of extracting a, a really good second use. And particularly if we look at energy transitions, then a second life batteries in, in that way are, are really important. I would, in addition to that, if you're using an EV, it also has the opportunity to be used for grid services uh, now. Right, so you, there's no there's there's kind of practical reasons why that's that's not in place, but there are plenty of tests around the world looking at using EVs for supporting grids uh, in, in so-called vehicle to grid technology, and that again in our transition to to low low carbon energy systems is really important. It provides uh, a, a large mass of energy that we could potentially draw on to move us several days if we, if we have. Uh, if our wind drops, for example, and that's that, I would anticipate being a really important tool with a, for our uh, for our energy system going forward. Now we've had um, the word design come up. Uh, Paul mentioned it, so it'd be quite interesting to get from everyone how they would say a design change is needed, or which part of the design perhaps. Um, interests them most where changes can be made. Um, Andy, could we start with, with you? Yeah, so I think the, the big issue for us, I think, is, is the um, structural adhesives that are used within most uh, pack designs. Um, and so in terms of chemistry, it's a very interesting area of working on, on new polymers, uh, ways in which uh, we don't necessarily have to gain um, strength through having these these structural adhesives because uh, these are really and it's not only for, for car batteries but pretty much all of technology is limited uh, by the adhesives that we use so it, it's reckoned that about 20 percent of us are walking around with uh, broken phones um, because of the adhesives that are used on the screens that are too difficult to actually uh, um, remove so adhesives is, is a, a big area of chemistry that, that's important um, in being able to have things which are obviously not only recyclable, but also can be repaired and reused, which is obviously the highest principle of, of, of green chemistry. Um, so that will be the first thing then, obviously, getting away from. So these battery packs that we use now are really an evolution from what's come from portable devices. So actually, many cars still have the same sorts of cells in them that we'd find in the back of our laptops. Uh, so these, these tiny little cells, which are then glued together to so disassembly um, and uh, pulling the cells apart is, is much more difficult than, than it needs to be. So it's partly design, it's partly chemistry, and it's partly materials. Um, so I think it's, it's quite clear that in the future, you know, as, as, as Paul's already said, that you know, iron-based systems are, are clearly the direction that we need to move towards, looking towards elements which are more sustainable, which are more readily available on the planet. Jacqueline, which, which design changes do you think are, are most needed or would make a big change? And it could be something necessarily, you know, it might not necessarily be here with us yet. <laughs> um, yes, I certainly agree with everything that's been said already, because it may be materials, it may be just about how complex you make your pack. Um, but I think uh, to a certain extent, when you consider the fact that every battery manufacturer makes their own tailor-made pack, which uh, structures the cells, put them together in a certain way. Um, and so we have an incredibly wide variety of pack designs, um, which then for a recycler who's collecting all of these, then has to have a system designed 
to take each of those apart. And so that would be a different system. So that then means you have to use people to take them apart and that costs a lot of money and time. Um, so if you wanted to automate the process, ultimately we should be trying to work towards the best standardized design of a pack um, that most EVs adopt, if that's possible. It, in addition to what's already been said, I think <laughs> An under, a better understanding and management of some of the hazards for, uh, that are posed by the, by the cells. So they, they, they are temperamental um, and management of the, of the hazards. So that it's, uh, when these cells are abused, they can undergo a, a thermal runaway. And that's, that's entirely manageable, but understanding that better and building an understanding of that into the de design of the pack I think would make recycling a lot easier. Uh, and Paul, since you brought up uh, the design, first of all, and it's interesting to, to, to hear about the software being used to improve and change the system, um, would, would perhaps implementing more software that uh, be incorporated in, in your ideal design or is there something else? Well, I think that um, it, it's necessary to look at design from the point of view of what is it that we're trying to accomplish. So we're actually not trying to accomplish recycling of batteries. We're trying to accomplish a, uh, a more sustainable world, right? And, and that needs energy. And so we start from that, from that function. And, and then we start thinking about, you know, traditionally we're very good at designing for function. Uh, so that's usually something we're great at. We just aren't good at the other unintended consequences. So then we have to start thinking about, as Andy was saying, design for disassembly. You know, if we're really going to um, to think about the entire life cycle, then we're going to uh, have to think about design for circularity and or design for degradation back into the environment. Because uh, while we might be able to get some, some cycles, the I don't think anybody thinks we're going to be able to do that infinitely, right? And so we're going to have to design for um, degradation back into the environment in a, in a harmless way. We also have to um, say that design also needs to leave room for future innovation. So the last thing we would ever want circularity to do is lock in our status quo knowledge, right? If we create such a system, such an infrastructure around circularity, the next generation materials, next generation energy storage is at a disadvantage, then that's, uh, that's something where we'll be really uh, harming our march towards sustainability. Um, Jacqueline, how do you think the, um, all these approaches will affect the carbon footprint uh, and cost of, of lithium-ion batteries in the future? Um, so I think uh, most of the things we discussed can help. Um, I think there's no one simple solution. I think we need to try and do as much as we can. But I think we also have to be very strategic and look across the whole life cycle and consider how we would design the supply chain, the battery packs, um, standardization, different monitoring system and different processes. So I think um, all of these approaches should be should be explored. So will the cost come down then and the carbon footprint improve? Hopefully, well, if we're talking over the whole life cycle, then certainly I think both costs and greenhouse gas emissions can be improved. But there may be sort of hot spots or spikes in certain stages of the supply chain. You may have increased costs in some areas and not in others. And so it's, it's trying to balance that. So that's really important. Can I jump in on that? So I, I think one of the co-benefits of of batteries in, in enabling the transition is that they will decrease their own greenhouse gas emissions by enabling a green a grid. Uh, a lot of the emissions in the, in the manufacture come from the use of electricity. So when we decarbonize that, that will drop. Um, uh, but I, th I think Paul's, Paul's point is a really good one that lithium ion batteries may not be the end of where we end up um, and there, there are certainly other technologies, uh, other battery chemistries that, that are interesting for different applications. So they may just be a route to something else. Uh, and it's important, I think, that we don't lock ourselves into, uh, again, just to mirror Paul's point, 
So we don't look, necessarily lock ourselves into a technology which, which could just be a route through to something else that we're not aware of at the moment. Well, that takes us on perfectly to what I was going to ask next, actually, which is what the battery of the future will look like. Um, Andy, what do you think it will look like? Yeah, well, I think as exactly as, as the panel has, has just discussed, uh, that um, I think if we look sort of um, 20, 30 years into the future, um, lithium won't be necessarily at, at the top of our list. It, it'll probably be the, the um, one of the, the products that we're using. However, I think that the batteries of the future will um, hopefully be based around other more sustainable elements, maybe sodium ion batteries. There will also be uh, a significant um, uh, increase in the use of fuel cells, that which will get rid of uh, around some of the issues associated with, with battery storage. Um, I think, however, that um, the different chemistries will be used in different areas, and we're seeing that already. If we look at the Chinese market, where they've almost overnight changed the um, sort of bus fleets to um, uh, lithium ion phosphate based, based cells. So we'll, we'll see that different chemistries will be used for different applications where you don't necessarily need power. Um, I think hopefully with time, the public will also uh, get used to the fact that, you know, the biggest challenge that, that most people have to buying an electric vehicle is, is this idea of range anxiety. So they see that, you know, 200, 300 miles is, is a, a real problem for them but actually the average distance traveled in most uh, developed countries uh, per vehicle per day is, is less than 50 miles. Um, so for the majority, you know, certainly more than 90% of, of vehicle um, journeys are far less than um, would, would require one charge per day uh, of a vehicle. So I think as people get used to this idea of electrification, uh, that um, we will find this, this uh, whole suite of different uh, power devices which come into a variety of, of different transport uh, mechanisms. Now, Paul, I saw you nodding there when Andy mentioned uh, China and what's going on there. So I, it would be nice to know what the international landscape is and then their uh, approach to battery recycling and whether it's on a par with what we've been discussing or whether there are perhaps different um, avenues of research in, in different countries? Oh, I think it's a patchwork internationally. It's, uh, I, I, would, I would say that there are uh, just as many different uh, approaches and, and thoughts uh, internationally as, uh, uh, as there are throughout, um, uh, throughout Europe. And, uh, but I, I did want to pick up on one, uh, one important point. Uh, Stepping back once again and looking at, are, are we asking the, the right questions? Uh, when we talk about energy storage, I, I think it's important to say, all right, are we going to store energy just because we want to store energy? In other words, we're talking about transport, right? Um, are we uh, saying that we need more and more electric batteries because we want to stay to our current model of having so many cars in the industrialized world. Um, when we know that electrification can happen in a variety of ways, we, we have a uh, hundred plus years of, of, of trolleys and subways. We have the, uh, the futuristic hyperloop that wouldn't, these wouldn't require the type of uh, battery technologies and whether or not we are going to just simply stick with the, um, the idea that we're going to have individual cars uh, where they are, you know, a, 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 ton, of, uh, a ton of material or, uh, or more, a couple of tons of material to, to carry around, uh, you know, a uh, 75 kilos of human being. Uh, so is, is this the right path? to just sticking on batteries onto these vehicles? Or should we think more about what the goal of transport is in terms of access and providing um, mobility and access to what's necessary? So um, I guess I'd, I'd pause there with just one uh, final remark is, I don't know what the future of energy storage is going to look like, but I hope it looks a lot more like nature. Um, the way that nature uh, generates, stores, transports its energy. 
uh, is always going to be the best model. Uh, and so the more that we move toward that, I'm guessing the, move, the more we're going to move toward sustainability. I think also to, to, to um, take that further, if we look at our, our use of materials, you know, Paul, Paul's quite right, that is that uh, most vehicles are stationary for 90% of their life. Uh, and so if you look at, um, you know, people are, are talking about sort of uh, higher base models where you know, effectively you can call up a, a vehicle at, at any time, uh, that would uh, take 90% of, of the vehicles off the roads uh, of, of the world and basically abolish car parks as, as we know them. Um, and so in, in terms of, you know, if you, if you were to reinvent a new transportation system tomorrow, you sure as hell wouldn't make it the current system that, that we currently have. I think part of the problem that we have is that we're trying to evolve and we're trying to evolve into something that looks pretty much like what we've currently got, which isn't necessarily the right way forward. So we're basically talking societal change here, as, as well as uh, battery improvements and uh, revolution and advances in chemistry. Yeah. Are, are we going to have this progress toward a more sustainable world, you know, be subject to keeping the status quo comfortable? Or are we going to say, nope, there needs to be some genuine leapfrog changes if we're going to do it with the time frame and the urgency at the scale that we need these changes to take place. Well, this seems a, a sort of good time to, uh, bearing in mind we've got the COP26 coming up, to get from each of you what you'd like to see policymakers do to improve the circular economy of batteries. And, and I think considering the scope of the, the conversation so far, it can be as, as wide uh, as you like in that interpretation. Um, Jacqueline, stop. Um, so I think we need to make the, the link between the, the manufacturers and the recyclers stronger. Um, whether we make manufacturers responsible re for recycling their own packs, which incentivizes them to then design the packs in such a way they can be recycled, or we make sure that there's a stronger link between recyclers and manufacturers to, to strengthen that uh, design for disassembly. So there's got to be greater cooperation Absolutely. at the moment between what's going on in research and, and industry. Solomon? Uh, that's a really good question, <laughs> given the breadth. Um, so I, I think, I think what's what's key is just accepting that that it's an issue that needs to be dealt with. I think actually I'd, I'd rather see policy put in place to support EV ownership so that that, so that, that grow and taking Paul's point about maybe not locking in our, our societal models. Um, we have our model at the moment and we need to take people with us in order to decarbonize. So I, I think we have lots of clever people doing clever stuff looking at recycling. I think the key thing societally is, is to make sure that EVs become more of a thing <laughs> and, and that the, we, we enable a wider spectrum of society to engage with that decarbonized technology. And um, are, are there any recent developments in particular that make you optimistic for, for this future ahead of us? I, th I think um, the point about range anxiety is, is a good one. I mean, that, that is something that comes up. And uh, even at a practical level, you can now go out into the market and acquire uh, vehicles with longer, longer ranges. I think that's something that's, that's already being dealt, dealt with to, to some extent. So I, I think we're already doing everything. <laughs> More can be done, but we're moving in the, in the right direction as, as far as that uh, goes much longer term kind of the kind of planning that Paul talks about is probably going to take over but in in a, in a shorter term transition I think that we we should be quite um we should be pleased really actually oh, that's, that's good don't be apologetic that's <laughs> that's good um Andy what would you like policy makers to do to improve the circular economy of batteries I, th I think that we're all moving in the right direction. I mean, the, um, the Chinese, the US uh, and the Europeans have all got new um, 
souped up uh, battery directives and uh, these have you know are, are all moving in the right direction i think we're all learning off each other um it's, it's very simple things that, that would help it's uh, so standardization in terms of labeling so that you know recyclers actually know what's what's in the battery it's a tiny very simple move um but actually it's probably one of the easiest things that allows you to segregate your chemistries out uh, before you do the recycling so you're not mixing iron with cobalt and nickel uh, for example um, so some very simple things that, that are, um, you know, that, that most manufacturers would not necessarily ob object to uh, can have the biggest effects. Uh, and I think, you know, we can see that what's already happening in China, which is that all the recyclers are in fact subsidiaries of the manufacturers. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that that will um, occur across the rest of the world as well. And finally, Paul. Well, I, I think that when it comes to policies coming out of the COP, it is you know, straightforward, even if it's challenging. Straightforward, you want policies that incentivize the, a, a change to more sustainability and disincentivize the status quo. So anything that incentivizes uh, 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 electric vehicles, uh, uh, anything that is addressing climate change, we need to strengthen the incentives and very much strengthen the disincentives for remaining in the status quo. And the thing that makes me optimistic is when it comes to uh, transport and, and batteries and electric vehicles, is electric vehicles are better cars. My electric vehicle is the best car I've ever owned. The performance is amazing. And so it's not the type of thing where you should have to you know, threaten or force people that once they get behind the wheel, they're going to want these cars because they are just so much better. So much better, but it still comes down to cost for a large number of people, though, doesn't it? Well, it's so interesting because people people ask me, oh, well, you get that great uh, fuel efficiency benefit, but but what about the additional cost? And I said, oh, interesting. How much, um, how much return on investment did you get for your leather seats? How much return on investment did you get for your convertible? People pay for what they value. And if you value a car that not only performs better, but is also at the same time environmentally better and is saving the world, people pay for value. And I think they'll pay for that. I, I think just to add to that, that the upfront cost of an EV is obviously much larger than of a, of a fossil fuel vehicle, of an ICE. <laughs> but, the, but the lifetime cost is, is comparative, if not better. Um, so where the policy intervention might come and would be useful is in reducing the upfront cost and allowing people to spread that across the lifetime of the vehicle. Right? So in a, in a kind of loan scheme without postulating something too specific. Um, so if you reduce that upfront cost for an EV, then you allow people to engage with them better and get the, the, the longer term lower cost that they have. Thank you. Well, some uh, great uh, advice and food for thought there. And that concludes our Royal Society of Chemistry discussion on the circular economy of batteries. My thanks to our panelists today, Dr. Jacqueline Edge from Imperial College London, Professor Andy Abbott from the University of Leicester, Dr. Solomon Brown from the University of Sheffield, and in the United States, Professor Paul Anastas from the Yale School of Environment. And thank you for watching. You can find more Royal Society of Chemistry discussions around the UN's COP26 programme on the Society's website at rsc.li slash COP and the numbers 26 or on their social media channels. So I hope you'll join me, Sue Nelson, and a host of expert guests for more episodes in this series as we explore chemistry's vital contribution to electrifying the planet's energy transition to net zero and powering new discoveries and innovations. The chemical sciences are at the heart of sustainability solutions. Sustainability. Powered by chemistry.